Good evening, good evening, good evening. I don't think I've ever said that before. Welcome here. My name is Jason Clausen, and I am so glad, and I can even hear in that speaker that I should move back. Ah, so disappointing. Fine. I think you've gathered already, and you've heard in my voice, my excitement to be meeting with you. Who is happy to be meeting in the house of the Lord today? Oh, it does my heart so good. I, I, I don't know. I know there's like these jaded pastors out there who like just want to like hide away or something like that. I, I was so excited to be able to meet with you guys today, to be able to gather with whoever wants to gather. No judgment on those who aren't ready yet, but I just want to meet with those who want to meet already. And I'm so glad and I am pumped to be here uh, as part of the open door in this time of transition and change and, and fluctuations and everything's all different. But God still stays the same, and his message in his heart is still the same. And so we can still worship him. We can still pray to him. We can still talk about him and learn about him, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? So, like, maybe four years ago, I don't know, I was living on Ken and Esther's farm still, then uh, uh, an interesting thing occurred, and I'd love for you guys, anybody here to tell me if you've ever heard of this, understood this, seen this, witnessed this, whatever. But we had one day where there was a, a rain overnight. And then, and then the next morning, it was like dewy, wet grass. But it was a, it was a hot, sunny day like today. And, and the grass was a little bit longer. Maybe I hadn't mowed it. I don't remember. So the grass was a bit longer. And I saw something absolutely bizarre. I've lived in Manitoba my whole life. I love nature. I love being out in nature. But the, the, I, went, I had chickens. I went to feed the chickens. And I got out, and there were just crayfish everywhere. You remember that, Dest? Just crayfish crawling everywhere. Like, like literally every square foot, like the size of the subwoofer, there'd be three or four crayfish everywhere. And then we had a pond, and the pond had like some crayfish. I mean, like I'd seen crayfish before, but like the pond was where that house is, and over here, there was like hundreds of crayfish everywhere. And I looked online, crayfish don't migrate, they don't congregate, they don't have like some mass hatching that I could tell. So if any of you know what was happening, tell me. What I did, because I'm me, is I grabbed an ice cream pail and I started gathering crayfish and I rinsed them and I boiled them and I made a shellfish alfredo, except instead of with like lobster or crab or shrimp, I used crayfish. And was it delicious, Dest? It was absolutely delicious. Way too much work, because you gotta rinse these things with like a little toothbrush. And then you got to like steep them in, in cold water till it comes out clean, which is like five or six rinsing, boil them in salt water and then pick them apart. And you get like a thumbnail sized chunk of meat from a big crayfish. So it took me like all afternoon, but it was delicious and it was weird. And so that's kind of like my game, I guess. I don't know. I like weird things. But the next day, the day after, our yard was littered with husks, little crayfish shells everywhere, like dozens of little white kind of semi-see-through crayfish hulls. Have you ever seen this? You know what I'm talking about? Nobody? You're all with me? Just say amen. Make me feel better. Oh, you're all tracking with me. Okay. Crustaceans molt. They shed, right? You're, you're aware of this? Have you ever seen this before? And it looks like a little miniature crayfish, but it's a white shell. It's just an outer skin because crayfish like all insects and ants and everybody else, are arthropods. And arthropods have what's called an exoskeleton. And an exoskeleton is, instead of having bones inside and soft skin outside, like us, their skeleton is outside. Exoskeleton, outside skeleton. That's what that means. And that's literally one of the defining features of arthropods is they have an outside skeleton, an exoskeleton. And so what happens is, obviously, as you grow, you start pushing up against your skeleton. And it's made of a substance called chitin. And chitin is exactly what your thumbnail is made out of. So if you look at your fingernail, imagine your body, your skin, being made of fingernail. You're all over. So as they grow, as, as crayfish grow, as crabs grow, as lobsters grow, whatever, in most insects, they'll, they'll push up against their outside skeleton. And they'll push and they'll push and they'll push. And, and eventually, they molt. So what they'll do is they'll go somewhere where they think they're safe and a little tear will start in their shell. 
And then the tear will slowly rip down the body over you know, a few hours and, until literally they walk out of their old skeleton. And then they're going to be little white, fleshy arthropods. Little crabs, little crayfish, little lobsters, whatever they are. They're going to be little white, soft fleshy, and then they're super vulnerable in this time period until the UV light, the sunlight, will slowly do a chemical reaction in their outer skin and it'll re-harden as a slightly larger crab. So if you've ever seen this, I've, I've been to the ocean and I've seen little crab skin. It looks like a little dead crab, but it's not. It's the exoskeleton of a crab. And it's a problem faced by all arthropods, any, any insect, any animal that's got an exoskeleton, they will bump up against their shell being fixed, and, and they have to do something. But that's not the only way arthropods deal with an exoskeleton. That's not the only way that arthropods deal with having a fixed outer shell. You see, because for a crab, they go through all of this work, all of this effort, this danger, this vulnerability, and this time of hiding. And when they come back, they are a minusculely slightly larger crab. They look identical. They move identical. They do things identical. Just slightly larger. Caterpillars do that too. Caterpillars will actually grow, press up against their skeleton, and then eventually the caterpillar will shed it and become a slightly bigger caterpillar. But not always. You see... Crabs will respond to stimuli. What, what that means is as they grow and they press against their outer skeleton, a crab will respond to that pressure and they will molt and they will end up with a slightly larger exoskeleton. But caterpillars sometimes don't just respond to stimuli. Sometimes caterpillars take the next leap. And what they do is they build a cocoon. I think you've all seen a cocoon, right? Amen? Amen. You've seen a cocoon? Okay, good. I, I wasn't sure how far back into grade school I had to go here. They build a cocoon. They actually make silk out of their mouth, and they will build a little shell called a cocoon or a chrysalis, and they will go inside that shell, and they will break their own body down into its constituent parts. If you crack open a cocoon, you wouldn't find a caterpillar. You would find green goo. It'll literally eat its own body, turn itself into its constituent parts, and emerge about a week later as a butterfly. You guys all know the story. Ah, fantastic. This is one problem, pushing up against an exoskeleton, solved in two ways. One is to shed your exoskeleton and recreate a essentially same, slightly larger exoskeleton. The other one is to go into a chrysalis, take a little bit longer, and come out as a butterfly transformed. See, the crab responds to stimuli by making a slightly larger crab. The caterpillar doesn't just respond to the stimuli, but it perceives what's coming and it transforms itself in metamorphosis into something completely new, which I think is a powerful story. It leaves behind the familiar shores and launches into something unknown yet ultimately something more beautiful and more versatile. There have been headwinds facing the church for probably 20 years. I, I, I'm not talking just about the Open Door Church. I mean the Church of North America. I, I, I can't tell you other countries, other countries, other regions have their own issues. Europe is probably 30 years ahead of us. We're heading in the same direction. Uh, Uganda is probably 30 years behind us. But, but honestly, where we are, we've had probably 20 years where the church has been facing headwinds. In my opinion, the Church of North America is stuck in a 1970s viewpoint in a 2020 culture. What am I talking about? Am I just babbling? Well, there's a changing culture. If you're alive for longer than eight years, you understand what I'm talking about. There's a changing culture, radically changing culture. It used to be, so I'm told, Unchurched and non-believing people came with many of the parts and understandings of Jesus and the church and the Bible because it was kind of baked into North America, right? I mean, the money in America says in God we trust, 
right? Canada was founded by largely Christians, and, and they were very much Christian countries. So even if you weren't a believer, you understood certain basic, fundamental, believer e type things. This used to be common. Often it was muddled or confused or misunderstood, but the pieces were there. Do you know what I'm talking about? That's changed over the last 20 years. People used to tend to accept that they were basically sinful, that something was wrong with them, that something was off, that the world wasn't as it should be and that they were a part of that problem. People tended to understand that and that, that in that something wrong, they generally should still try to serve each other and, and work for each other to make the world a better place. Billy Graham in the 1970s and 80s could stand up in front of a group of people and say, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of, lo- of God. But thankfully, Jesus Christ has come to save our sins. And if you'd but look to the cross and accept him, then you can be saved. And like tens of thousands of people would come rushing forward. I have watched evangelists who have gotten better and better and better and better speakers and teachers and Billy Graham as the harvest went down and down and down and down. Because it's a 1970s viewpoint. I'm not mocking Billy Graham. He's an idol of mine. He's a hero of mine. What I'm saying is it worked then. It doesn't work now. Because the same components don't come. We live in a postmodern world or a post postmodern world. And if you don't know what that means, what, what that basically means is for several generations, now slowly this has grown, we've been taught a message of um, your feelings are what matters. How you feel is what matters. There is no absolute truth. All truth is relative. You can interpret it based on how you feel and you can live your own truth. Somebody told me the other day, you do you, boo. I didn't even bother looking that up because I don't know what half those words mean. But this is the basic idea. Hey, that works for you. Fantastic. I'm doing my own thing. Except that we live in this charged, hyper-partisan world where people are growing by tribe and camp and not by any solid truth underneath. Are you understanding what I'm saying here? This is the kind of headwinds that the church has been facing for, I'm going to say 20 years, maybe more than 20 years. The church's message is of dying to self. But that's absolutely opposite to what culture preaches. The church's message is of service and of sacrifice. But the message of the world is one of conformity to culture and of comfort. So if it makes me comfortable and if it helps me fit into my culture, then that's my truth. And I don't care that you have needs I don't care that you have designs or desires because service and sacrifice are absolutely opposite to our world. Evangelism and church growth in North America used to be like buying a piece of Ikea furniture. Maybe some assembly was required, but the pieces were all there. Nowadays, I would say evangelism and church growth and health and, and the kingdom of God is like walking into a forest looking for a chair. All the pieces are there. It's going to take you a few more years of work. It's not like Ikea. The stuff isn't all there. We're starting back at ABCs in a culture that is absolutely against who the church is, who the open door is. We've seen this in in even Morris, in, in people taking offense to church and to the message of Christianity. So as a church, we've been wrestling with change for, for decades, honestly. With a changing culture, with changing generations, with changing leadership, and a changing world around us. Um, On to that leadership point. I I usually stay away from controversy, so I'm going to try tiptoe here. Our world leaders just shut down the church for four months. Now, you can't shut down the church. Don't get me wrong here. Anywhere two or more are gathered, there's Jesus, right? So if you were at home, we were still doing the church, right? We were still growing and discipling. But somebody snapped their finger and we couldn't meet together for, what, four months? Does that scare you? Does that bother you? And it bothers me. It doesn't scare me because I know who Jesus is. But that actually bothers me that somebody in Ottawa can do this and it's illegal to meet. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, A little while ago, if you want to have summer students subsidized by the government for uh, nonprofits, you had to sign a paper saying you fully supported abortion. Now, does that bother you? It bothers me. 
our world leaders are changing. Things have changed. Some politicians in Canada are openly questioning, openly questioning if the Bible should be labeled as hate speech and banned. Now, it's not going to happen for a while, but that's where some of our leaders are at. We live in a changing culture. We're trying to reach changing generations, and we're under changing, and I'm going to be honest, often hostile leadership. We are not the church of the 1970s. And yet we have a message, a core message, and a core identity in the gospel and in Jesus that never changes. You see what I'm saying here? We have a, a world that never stays the same and is constantly changing, yet we have a gospel and a Christ and a God that never changes. And we always are in the kind of tension of trying to figure out how to keep the gospel message the same and yet reach a culture that's always changing. It's difficult. In this church, change has been the only constant. Depends how long you've been going here. I've been going to this church for about 27 years since it was founded. It was founded in my parents' basement, three houses that way. That was where the first meeting of this church was, 27-ish years ago. Since then, we've met in a basement. We've met in a nursery. We've met in a school gymnasium or NPR, I guess, technically, the multi-purpose room. And then we bought a little building that's now a house that used to be, I think, a Zion Tabernacle Church or something like that. And then we sold that, we moved to the multiplex, and now we're meeting in a park. That's 27 years. That's a lot of moving in 27 years. Uh, we used to have no pastors. We just had a kind of leadership team that did the pastoral work. We brought in guest speakers. And we had Paul Vieira for a while. How many of you remember Paul Vieira? Ah, uh, there's three of you. Four counting me. And then we had Gavin and Joan come to visit for a while and they did some stuff and then they left for Africa and we were back in kind of this no man's land. And then Gavin and Joan came back and they led this church for almost 20 years, 15 years, whatever it was. And then now I've come along and literally I was six when this church was founded. So we've gone through some changes. Now some of those changes were molts. Some of them like moving from the nursery to the NPR were just we grew big and there was pressure and we shed an exoskeleton and we grew a little bit, but we looked basically the same. We just moved. Some of those changes were metamorphosis. Some of those changes were, were transformational, honestly. Uh, the move from the little church building to the multiplex, when we changed our name from, who could tell me our old name? Morris Praise and Worship Chapel to the open door. There was some big transformation that we did. We incorporated as a church. We did all of this stuff. It was a big deal at that time. So today we stand on the edge of something new, something different, and something that will require change in order to rise to the challenge. These are the things we've been talking about for a few years. Then COVID entered, and it stopped being an academic conversation, and it suddenly became very real. Karen said it before, the world's changed, and it's not going back. I'm actually going to be honest. In my opinion, the world has slowly and subtly changed over the last decade, and this COVID time just drew it to the forefront. But however you want to view it, however it makes it comfortable, things have changed. They're not going back. Things have accelerated, and we're trying to rise to meet this. So what's the next iteration? Well, in this time, the Open Door Church leaders have been seeking God's face. We've been seeking his will and his heart for the open door and not just for the open door because we can go, God, what do you have for me? What do you have for me? What do you have for me? But we are a church in a community, in a local community, right? So God, what are you doing in our community? In Morris, in Rosenort, in Riverside, Albany, what are you doing, God, that we can become a church that would be responsive? Remember, not just responding to stimuli, but trying to lead our culture through change. It's really what we're shooting for. And at this time, we don't just want to rebuild and repair what we had. We want to rebuild and repair what God wants in the community of Morris for the church of the open door. So what are we rebuilding and repairing into? Well, this season is not a time for molting. This season is a time for metamorphosis. This season is a time to become what's needed for the next 20 years, to be able to reach our culture to be able to see our friends and family enter into the joy of the Lord, to see the kingdom of God grow in Morris and in your hearts, to see the transformation in your own life from a, a slow and steady Christianity to a radical and powerful spirit-filled Christianity. This is not a time for baby steps. It's a time to actually dig deep, 
figure out who we are and who God's calling us to be and move into that next generation. Our culture is changing and has already changed. New cultures, new views on safeties, new passions, new generations, new leaders. You can hate it. You can like it. You can understand it. Honestly, I think at best, I understand about half of what's going on in culture. It's about all I can tell you, to be perfectly frank. It doesn't matter. It's happening. As a church, we've decided we do not want to merely respond to this change. We want to lead into this change, whatever that means. Leave familiar shores and allow God to transform us into something beautiful and more versatile. The time now is for metamorphosis, not molting. So there, there are two basic views on change. And, and you've all experienced both of them in times of change in your life already. One is to be scared and one is to be excited. And, and you can be scared because it, it's hard to give up the old. It's hard to give up the familiar and the routine. Even if the old and familiar isn't working, it's comfortable and it's known and what's next is not known, and so it's not comfortable. You don't even have to think what was was great to be in love with what was. Change is hard. Or on the same time, you can be excited because of the new dreams God is dreaming, and that he's calling forth to be dreamt in each one of us. And so you can be caught in this moment of being scared and excited. Hey, you can be both if you want, and guess what? Both are perfectly valid and perfectly real. It's okay to be both scared and excited because change is scary and change can be exciting. Now, I think, though, there are two things that can make change easier and more comfortable, and we're going to go through both of them today, if I can. The second thing, I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but the second thing is to be clear and excited about your new dreams, to be clear and excited. See, as long as it's something, it's vague and uncertain. It's hard to get excited about something. So that's the second thing, is to be clear and excited about new dreams. But that's actually not the first thing we need. The first thing we need, I think the most important thing, is to recognize and affirm what isn't changing. To know your anchor points. To know what's permanent. It's easiest to fly a kite if somebody's holding the string, right? It's that anchor point that gives the kite the freedom to fly. And the kite might move around in the sky, but as long as the anchor is steady, you're still flying a kite, right? You're, you're with me here? To know what's permanent, what's constant, and what's unchanging. You can walk a new trail you've never walked, and if the road signs are familiar and you know how to read them, it's not scary. And so I think actually the first thing in metamorphosis, the first thing in true change is to know what's constant and what's never changing. And so today, this morning, I want to spend time talking about who we are as a church. I'm talking about metamorphosis and throughout the summer, I'm going to be talking more about this and I'm going to go into details and, and hearing you guys and we're going to be dreaming dreams. We're going to be co-dreaming what this can look like. But for now, today, I want to talk about what's not changing and what's constant forever. You see, there's two ways to explain metamorphosis to a caterpillar. One way is to say, okay, so you're going to spit out a little prison. You're going to go crawl into the prison of your own spit. You're going to die. Your brain's going to turn to mush, bake into a mush. Then you're going to come out as a completely different thing, utterly unlike anything you've ever been, and then your world will be forever changed. Now, if I were a caterpillar, that sounds scary. It's true, by the way, 100% true what I just said. It's just scary. Or there's a second way. You're going to build a little safety net around you. And in this safety net that's there to protect you, you're going to slowly break yourself down to the most important parts. And then after some careful time rebuilding, you'll emerge with a very similar body plan, the same DNA, but you're going to be 10 times as beautiful and you'll have the ability to fly on the breeze and drink nectar all day. Right? That's also completely true. Both stories are completely true which one you look at will determine whether it's scary or exciting. So what are the important parts? What are the immovable constituent pieces? Isaiah 43, 18 to 21. This is what the words of God say in the book of Isaiah. 
Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? It will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me. The jackals and the ostriches, for I have given water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people who I have formed for myself, that they might declare our praise. What this is saying is, even though God's doing a new thing, if his people will declare his praise, even the wild beasts will honor him. Your friend, your family member, your co-worker, who is stubbornly and obstinately refused to hear you out on your love for Jesus, this is a wild beast or a jackal or an ostrich, there you go. Next time you can go to work, you can go to your family gathering, you go, you jackal. Say your pastor gave you permission. No, but probably don't do that. God's doing a new thing. In fact, a little bit later in Isaiah, in verse four, or in chapter 48, verse 6 to 7, God says, you have heard, now see all this, and will you not declare it? From this time forth, I announce to you new things hidden things that you have not known. They are created now, not long ago. Before today, you've never heard of them, lest you should say, behold, I knew them. What that means is God creates new things. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, but he creates new delights for his children. And in a time of new things, there are things God can do with you guys, with us. There are things God can do this year that he's literally never done before. He's been waiting till a time like this, till a group like this was willing to say, God, what do you have for me? He's got new things. I've been through a lot of change in this church and the reality is every change was scary. So today I want to talk about what's not going to change and what's constant. The caterpillar and the butterfly have the same DNA. If a scientist would do a little DNA test on both of them, he would have to confirm that they were the exact same animal. In fact, he would say nothing's changed. But if you're looking at it, it looked like everything has changed, but the truth is somewhere in the middle. The core didn't change, but everything outside changed. So, what are the core bits? We're going to seek first the kingdom of God, and then we're going to let everything else get added unto this. What is the kingdom of God for the open door? Faith, family, freedom. Have you heard that before, by the way? Have you heard me talk about faith, family, and freedom? Raise your hand if you've heard me mention faith, family, freedom. It's not changing. It's not changing. In fact, we say it this way. We want to create a culture where people grow in faith, belong to a family, and find freedom. Oh, that was so simple. What does that mean? We are, and we will be, a charismatic, evangelistic, non-denominational church that has been called to reach our community by loving people radically. If that's your thing, get on board. This is who we are. We are a charismatic, evangelistic, non-denominational church that has been called to reach our community by loving people radically. I'll say it this way. I'll summarize it this way for you. Love Jesus, love each other, love your community, be filled with the Spirit. Simple. Love Jesus, love each other, love your community, be filled with the Spirit. That's what we're about. That will never change. I don't care what else changes. That foundation will be the same in 50 years if I'm still alive. Amen? Amen. But there's a whole lot that will change. I don't even know what it all is. We're going to be walking through that this summer. In fact, I want to get a little bit more specific for you, if I may. I said faith, family, freedom. What does that mean, right? You can just kind of fill in your own words to that one. So I want to put a little flesh on those bones. Faith. The believer's journey starts with a personal relationship with Jesus. But it doesn't end there. Becoming a fully committed follower of Jesus is a process that is developed through Christian disciplines, such as prayer, fellowship, worship, and teaching. Therefore, it's our desire to provide opportunities for growth and God encounters that will lead to life transformation. This is discipleship. In fact, the early Christians weren't called Christians, they were called disciples because they did discipleship, which is to say they practiced disciplines of worship and prayer They took communion, they laid hands on each other, and through these disciplines, they grew to look more like Jesus. That's what we mean when we say faith. We want you, if you're not a believer, we want you to find the joy that is in the life of Jesus. And if you found that joy, we want you to be rocket shipped, accelerated in your love of Jesus, transformed metamorphosis into something new. 
behold a new creation. What does family mean? Some of you are in family groups. That's awesome. That's actually not entirely what we mean when we say family. I mean, we want families to come to our church, but here's what we say. Family is best seen through the relationship of God and his son, Jesus. It's baked into the Trinity, father, son, family. God sent his only son to redeem mankind so that we too would enjoy this family relationship. Together as we worship, we make up the family of God. We are a family right now. Yeah. Man, I miss this. And experience God's love for us and for each other. At the open door, everyone is invited to the family table. Somebody drives by, they can come. You're all welcome because we can all worship God together. We've always been this. Lastly, freedom. Jesus invites us to come as we are, right? We're all invited at the family table, but, but he also promises to not leave us in our brokenness. He sent us his Holy Spirit, whose job is to reveal Jesus to us and to free us from addictions and bondages so that we're free to serve Jesus wholeheartedly and to love people passionately. Those things that get in the way of your love of Jesus and your growth and your discipline. Anything that gets in that way, be it sports, which seems fantastic, be it time with family, be it those friends who give you whatever, those are good things, or addictions, or passivity, or fear, or, or a suffocating, crippling lack of courage, whatever those things are, the Holy Spirit's job is to reveal them in us, and then reveal Jesus to us, so that we can be transformed, so we can be a better family to each other, so that we can serve Jesus better, love Jesus, love each other, love our community, love the Holy Spirit, be filled with